Oh man, I feel like we like need a, we all need like walk-up songs or something. But anyway, we're going to talk about Lou. This is how tall Lou is. Aren't they tall and beautiful? Um, Lou, they them, is a queer non-binary butch poet and inspiring homesteader whose work lives mostly on Instagram. They write about love, nature, and heartbreak with a focus on queer kinship. Growing up poor in rural New York, Lou created their own sense of adventure using what they had, which was land to explore. And though they once found poetry inaccessible, their confidence has since been bolstered by a robust and supportive poetry community. In college, they were lucky enough to spend time sharing post-performance carrots and hummus with Andrea Gibson at their campus's designated queer house, where they first discovered how exciting poetry can be. As the middle-ish child of a blended family, Lou finds chaos exciting and gleans inspiration from human connection, communication, and other forms of art. Their favorite thing is when someone they love speaks a sentence that turns into an opening line of a poem. An adventurer, explorer, tinkerer, storyteller, and survivor, Lou writes poems for themselves and for the people who want to enjoy them along with them. They think of their work as the daffodils of poetry. Ubiquitous, I hope I nailed that. <laughs> but still makes you feel good. They hope to publish a volume of poetry someday. And yes, their typewriter comes on camping trips with them. <laughs> Lou lives in Chicago with their girlfriend, two cats, and an eye towards moving their whole family into a farmhouse in upstate New York. Okay. Their Instagram is LT underscore chicken. Let's give it up for Lou. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turtle. Yeah, uh, I'm being dead serious. Uh, <laughs> for instance, Leonardo, uh, he's like the leader of the group, so he's really disciplined and hardworking, and he's and he's empathetic. Uh, Raphael, uh, really passionate. Uh, got a short fuse though, stubborn, um, but really brave. Uh, and then there's Donatello. Yeah, Donatello is a tinkerer. Um, he's really creative uh, and smart. And uh, I just realized how like I'm talking myself up in these little ninja turtles. <laughs> yes. yeah. He's also really observant, but he's a little anxious. He's a little anxiety baby. Uh, and then there's Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo is fun-loving, goofy, and free-spirited, but he's also kind of irresponsible. Um, so he's like the stoner of the group. Um, <laughs> But he brings a lot of levity, um, so that's that's a good good thing for him. Um, and then there's Splinter. He's not a Ninja Turtle at all. He's a big fucking rat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he's the dad of the group, um, and he brings a lot of balance. Um, and if you know anything about me, I am the dad of my group. <laughs> born a year after the Ninja Turtles. They were born in 1984. I was born in 1985. Do not hurt yourselves, queers. I'll do the math for you. Uh, I am 37 years old. <laughs> and so we grew up together. Um, I watched them every morning. Uh, they were my first butch root. Um, and I really thought they were real. Uh, and I thought they would be there for me anytime I needed them. My older sister, Kayla, did not help in this fantasy I concocted. Uh, she told me that they were real and that they actually lived in the sewers. And any chance I got, I would go try to look for them in the sewers. And thankfully for her and for me, those caps weighed about 20 of my little body. Um, yeah, so, whew, we cut a lot out here, sorry. Uh, my Halloween, by Halloween 1990, um, I'm five years old and I wanted to be a... Ninja Turtle! Thank you, that was perfect. Uh, at the time, Leo was my favorite Ninja Turtle, but all those costumes were sold out, so I had to settle for Raphael. Um, but my costume was fucking cool. Had a plastic shell that hung on my shoulders like a book bag, and it had a green mask and a pull-on green suit. And I went into school proud as can be. And I sat in my little listening circle in front of my teacher 
and this boy came up behind me and kicked me in the back of the shell. And it cracked down the middle. No! Uh, Raphael was pooping in my little veins. <laughs> so I head kicked him in the chest. Yeah! Yeah! And then I was sent home early. Um, now, I can only kick about this high now. But back then, I can high kick. Yeah, yeah. Five, five year old limber, five year old limber body. That's yes. me right there. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm waiting in a long hallway on a wooden chair for my mom to pick me up. And I'm looking at the ground. And when I look up, Leo, Mikey, and Donnie are sitting in front of me. And they say to me, It's okay, Raph. Being in the Deternal is... Sorry, messed that line up. Go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Raph. Scarred shells are part of being in the Deternal. That's how they talk. They're like teenage surfer dudes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I didn't know it then, but I later realized what my sister had given me. She had planted a seed of imagination so strong that I became really good at role-playing to get out of hard parts of my life. Mm. And other parts of my life later. <laughs> <laughs> we, know, we know what I mean. We know what I mean. No. <laughs> uh, turtle power. Sorry, wait, I, that was my fault. <laughs> Turtle power uh, <laughs> is what got me here today on the stage in front of all of you beautiful people. And I couldn't be happier to be here. And I think little Lou Aww. would really be proud of Big Lou. Or I, the other way around. You know what I mean. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank Rain and Whitney. Um, for inviting me up here today. Um, when Rain called me to be the feature, my heart fell through my butt. Um, and then I summoned the confidence to say yes. Uh, I have said it time and time again, you two, but you have provided a beautiful stage in front of this amazing warm audience for us queer people to get up and share our work. So thank you for having me. Yes. Uh, and before I really get rolling, I want to introduce two people that came here with me tonight. Um, they got my comp tickets. Um, yeah. um, the first one is Marilyn, and she's sitting right over here. Um, and so, uh, Marilyn and I met two years ago. She hired me on TaskRabbit to build some IKEA furniture for her. <laughs> And then she kidnapped me. <laughs> just, kid, just kidding. Um, but really, I've been now I go there every week. Every Monday, we have dates. And sometimes I hang things for her. Sometimes she makes me French toast. Um, but we just have a good time together. We chat. And sometimes we have like a really hard time like labeling our relationship. We've tried companion or comrade. Um, but nothing seems to fit. But I can stand up here confidently right now and tell you that she's my friend. Oh, yes! Woo! I was a little nervous that Marilyn was coming tonight because I'm going to say share th things about my life and they're going to be like a little sexy and a little kinky. Okay. But then I remembered that Marilyn was friends with a Playboy bunny. Um, and they hung out at the Playboy Mansion together. Oh. So she's gonna be just fine. Yeah, she's gonna be fine. Um, Marilyn has lived a fascinating life. So if you get a chance at all to talk to her tonight, please take it. Um, thank you for being here, I love you. Woo! Next up is my sweet nugget. Yes! My forever sleepy baby princess. Yes! She's, she's embarrassed, but she's gonna be fine too. Um, my honey pot and the great, great love of my life. Um, that's Mariella, right over there. You've seen her at many a fruit salad, and I'm always trying to get her up here on the mic because she's a lot funnier than me. Um, but she's convinced, she's convinced that she's in her stage mom era. Um, which, which, which may be true, but she's also an NYU Tisch Theater grad and a James Beard nominated food writer. So I'm gonna get her up here at some point. Honestly, if it wasn't for her, 
this show would have been a fucking mess. <laughs> she is my editor, my director, my producer. Um, she got me through the whole fucking process, and honestly, through every meltdown, and I mean, I had many. Um, we broke a lot of pencils. I broke a lot of pencils. <laughs> I did break a lot of pencils. <laughs> I made sure, I, she made sure everything was tight, you know? She just did a good job. So thank you, honey, for having my back. Yes! I love you. All right, all right, all right, all right, here we go. Here are four things you should know about me. One, I came out when I was 14 years old. It wasn't the best, but it wasn't the worst. Uh, two, my lover and I have been trying to have a baby for the entirety of our relationship. Three, I'm a Libra. Yeah! So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some really sappy love poems for y'all. Yeah. Yeah. And four, I discovered Justin Bieber. Bieber? Bieber? Yeah. I, discuss, I discovered Justin Bieber before Usher did. I did. We're gonna hear that story later. All right, <laughs> act one, coming out. The year is 1999. I'm 14 years old. This song is number one on the charts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, keep it going. Come on. Sad self. I really don't think we're strong enough. Oh. Yes. Love after love. Yes. I knew that was going to be a hit. The next couple songs followed followed were Angel of Mine by Monica, yes. Heartbreak Hotel by Whitney Houston, yes. and Kiss Me by Sixpence on the Richer. Yes. Yeah, so you can imagine my little te Libra teen self is in their feels. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right around this time, Microsoft comes out with this new device called Web TV. Does anybody know what that is? No. Oh boy, okay. <laughs> I've aged myself. You don't even know? Oh my god. It was, a, it was really simple. It was ahead of its time. Uh, it was a box that hooked up to your television that turned it into a monitor so that you could access the internet. And the keyboard was wireless using LED, like a remote control. We all know what those are. Okay. <laughs> and it was basically, a, it was basically like a low cost alternative to accessing the internet. Um, my parents knew that this was the new toy that every teenager wanted. And so for my 14th birthday, that's what they got me. Um, they had no idea the world that they were allowing into my room unsupervised. <laughs> Zero. Um, my cousin Jessica came over one day and was excited to try out my new toy with me. So we connect in the privacy of my room. And we hop on the chat rooms. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, eventually Jessica gets bored and she turns to me and says let's pretend we're someone else let's pretend we're a boy oh. Oh. Okay. and I'm like okay yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm really excited about it and I don't I know why deep down but I haven't said it out loud yet um, yeah so Jessica Jessica ends up going home, and the game is over, but I don't want it to be. <laughs> so the next day, I jump back into the chat room, and I go, to, I go into this chat room called Can't Hardly Wait, named after the movie. Oh my God. Jesus. My... <laughs> My screen name is Eclipse 18 with two S's. So, so Eclipse. Yeah. Sexy. Mariella loved that one during rehearsals. Every time I said it, she would crack up. I was like, what is it about my username? And I type in, I type in, hi everyone, new here. And ASL fills the screen. We all know what ASL is. Yeah. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, I type 18 male. New York. Yep, uh-huh, we're getting there. Uh, and they say, cool, what's your name? And I say, Scott. <laughs> Where do you think I got Scott from? We're gonna find out right now. Um, 
I played this board game called Dream Phone. Does anybody, does anybody know this game? No, nobody knows. Dream Phone uh, came with this little pink cordless phone. And it came with a deck of cards with just dreamy boys on them. And, and my, fa my favorite dreamy boy was Scott. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> he worked. remake this board game with just like queer people. Yeah. Like dream for queer people. Yeah. Um, Scott worked at Jim's gym. That's what that is up there. Um, but yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, lost her place here. Uh, so girls start to PM me and they're asking for pics. And I panic. And I run down to my mom's room where there's a bin of pictures and I grab a bunch of them and I scan them and I get them on the internet and boom, I'm in. Scott, 18, lives in New York and looks exactly like my gay brother, Matthew. <laughs> it's my gay my brother. I haven't told him that I'm doing this yet, so he'll... We'll get the recording tomorrow. Uh, I go to school and all I can think about is how to get back to all my girlfriends. <laughs> they start asking for phone calls. I sneak into the barn and I call them from the cordless phone. And they think, they think I haven't gone through my voice change yet. They, they're just not suspicious. They're just not. Uh, and I have a rule. This is a very important rule. They can only call me at designated times. This is important. Uh, girls start to send me letters. Long ones. And I'm keeping track of the mail person and when they come so I can intercept them so my mom doesn't find them. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> eventually, I start sending them letters back. But I want to send them trinkets of my love. So, uh, Libra, guys, come on. Um, so I sneak into my mother's bedroom and I open her jewelry box. It's, a, it's only costume jewelry from her days at the flea market selling flea market stuff. So I pull a bunch of rings out and I start popping them in envelopes. But I'm not really well versed in the mail system. So the mailman is just putting them back in the mailbox, <gasps> signing them undeliverable, and my mom is intercepting them. <laughs> and she's opening them up, and she's popping her rings out, and she's reading these letters signed by Scott. <laughs> she doesn't say anything. Um, in this next paragraph, I'm going to dead name myself. Bear, bear with me, it's fine, it's just part of the story. Um, so one day, Summer, um, one of my many girlfriends, breaks the rules. Yeah, what's the rule? Thank you very much. <laughs> the phone rings, my mother opens my door and is handing me the cordless. She says, it's Summer for Scott. <laughs> shaking. I don't know what to do. Um, and she goes, isn't that you? <laughs> and I start, I start to ramble. No, 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 no. Scott, Scott's my friend. He, 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 he just, I told him his girlfriends could call the house because his mom is really strict and you're really cool. <laughs> she shuts the door and hands me the cordless. Oh God, here we go. Uh, I put the phone to my ear. Oh, and right then, right then, I know my mom is walking down the hallway into her bedroom to pick up the other line. <laughs> so I raise the phone to my ear and Summer's voice penetrates the line. <clears throat> Hi, Scott. It's Summer. I've been thinking about you all day. Summer and I've soaked through my chair. <laughs> Listen. I was still really charming at 14, aren't I? I 
could have counted to two, my door flings open. <laughs> Lauren Taylor Burroughs, get off the phone right now. Summer, I've got to go. Summer really fucked my shit up. So, this is the sad part of the story. I'm shaking, she's talking at me. Are you gay? And I'm screaming, no, no, I'm not gay, I'm just helping out a friend. If you're gay, we can get you help. And now I'm on the floor, my back's against my bed, and my knees are tucked into my chest and I'm rocking and I'm crying. And I realize in that moment that I've already seen this before, two years earlier. I'm in the living room and I'm playing Earthworm Jim on Sega. Where are my people? Thank you. My brother Matt and my mom are arguing in the dining room. And I don't think much of it because my family's always loud and always arguing. And I'm playing my game, so. Um, but then I hear my mother yell, Matthew, are you gay? Ooh. And I pause the game, and I look over, and Matt's back's against the wall, and he's got his knees tucked to his chest, and he's crying, and he's saying no, 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 over and over again, until eventually he screams yes. And our mother says, we'll get you help. And I unpause the game. My mother finally gets her confession from me and she closes the door. The phone rings again. It's Summer. Oh, You're talking to a 14 year old girl. She hangs up on her. How was that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my catfishing days were over. <laughs> yeah, that sucked. Uh, Summer will log on and tell everyone that I was duping them. I'm grounded for an unspecified amount of time, uh, but my mother has a watchful eye on me, but eventually she gets busy and I find an opportunity to log back on. And I'm scared to re-enter the chat room. Uh, I know there will be questions and anger, but I hover my cursor over the link and I click. The PMs start to flood in. Some are angry, as expected, and I try to explain why I did it to the best of my 14-year-old ability. The ones who surprise me, the ones who still wanna be friends. Or the ones who are like, I already knew. Uh, I was just waiting for you to get the confidence to tell me. Or the ones who were like, I'm bi, this could still work. <laughs> <laughs> or the ones who were the ones who were like, I get it, it's hard being gay. Uh, it wasn't my family who got me through the hardest parts of coming out. It was these people who I had lied to for so long. They forgave me and, it sa and then said it was nice to meet the real you. If it wasn't for Can't Hardly Wait and at the chat room and web TV, I don't think I would have had enough support to live out and proud so early. But with their help and understanding, I started that journey with the people in my life, my lacrosse team, my friends, my coaches, my teachers. And I was always able to log in and talk, oh, if, if somebody didn't take it well, I was always able to log in and talk to them about it. Eventually, web TV became defunct, and we bought a real computer that logged on to AOL. And my parents did not learn their lesson. They hooked it up in my bedroom. <laughs> I don't know why they did that. Uh, and the first day I logged on, I went into the chat rooms, and in the little search bar, I typed in Syracuse lesbians. <laughs> I'm gonna read uh, three poems for you. <laughs> this one's called Matthew. Eight days shy of my 13th birthday, one day after National Coming Out Day, Matthew Shepard died after being found strapped to a fence like a gay Jesus. My brother who shared his name had been forced out of the closet two years earlier. The courage I thought I had to come out was constantly smothered, pushed back inside me like I was being muddled into a drink. I could see my brother's tears leaking out from behind closed doors. I think he saw himself in those headlines. I remember thinking, wondering, 
that the Wyoming sun reflecting off Matthew's face made his tears look like glitter. This one is called My Name. The name my parents gave me is not dead to me. I just put it to rest. Mm -hmm. And by put it to rest, I mean I folded it up in an old handkerchief, tucked it into a chest surrounded by cedar chips, then placed it in my attic. And by attic, I mean the chambers in my heart. Because that name has history. It has stories of who I was, pieces that I still hold close. I did not die back there. I just rearranged my letters. L O U. Feels good on me. Feels short, feels sweet. And how lovely it was to move to a place where no one knew my name. Where the debris of who I once was doesn't roll over me like a dust storm, filling their mouths with the grittiness of a person who had a black hole sucking the good bits out of me. How good it feels that a name can make you whole. This last one is called Butch Mermaid. I like football, drinking beers, making fires, chopping wood, building calluses, but I also like taking bubble baths and pretending I'm a butch mermaid. Look at this butch, isn't he neat? Then I wonder what a collection of butches would look like. I picture that really famous photo of all those construction workers sitting on a metal beam above New York City. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, I think <laughs> I think they are building one of the bridges. They are all eating lunch, legs dangling, some shirtless, no harnesses or safety equipment, shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. I want that feeling of lightly touching another butch's shoulder with mine while I eat a turkey sandwich. <laughs> Thousands of feet in the sky, just knowing we were all up there being butched together. Maybe there's a cigarette hanging out of my mouth. Maybe my big arms are exposed. Maybe if I was tightrope walking that beam, I wouldn't look down. I would just look straight ahead, letting my butch comrades guide me way up here. The clouds don't hate us. So a, a quick blurb about where I'm from. I'm from Syracuse, New York, originally. Woo! Yeah. Syracuse! Woo, really? Yeah. Really, my people. Wow. Woo! Fucking love that. Um, I also I grew up out like in a little town called Kirkville. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Kirkville was. I grew up on a ho hobby farm, and around me were many, many um, working local farms, and. Um, they provided us all the food we ate. We grew up really poor. So there was crop farmers, dairy farmers, and cattle farms. Um, and so local farming is super important to me. Um, that's why I chose So Fire Farm to be my give back partner. Um, so Fire Farm is all about using black and indigenous wisdom to teach more sustainable farming practices, like no-till farming, cover crops, carbon sequestration in soil, and stuff like that. And that's all wrapped into regenerative farming, which will combat um, global warming, but also keep these local farms open for generations to come. Um, it's really important to me, and this farm is so cool, and if you're ever in upstate New York, you should go check them out and visit them. But also, if you have any money in your little pockets, you can go put it in that little jar over there. Thank you. Act two. Uh, my lover and I have been trying to have a baby for the entirety of our relationship. Yeah, yeah. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Mariella and I have been dating for four years, and on our first date, she was 45 minutes late. And when she finally did arrive, she plopped her purse down on the bar, and she looked me dead in the eye, and she said, full disclosure, I'm in a real butches ain't shit phase right now. herself because butches were failing her. Oh. That was my cue to leave. <laughs> but I didn't because her leggings were really tight and her ass looked amazing. <laughs> so 
so the date continues and it's going really well and we're laughing and we're making out at the bar and the drinks are flowing and I finally have the courage to say, you know, I want to have a baby one day. And because I'm married at the time, uh, she says that I'm catfishing her uterus, which we all know from Act One I'm very good at. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to bother her too much because she invites me back to her apartment and we fuck till 4 a.m. And then we and then we go down to her local bodega and we order a chopped cheese with banana peppers. Yes! That's the only way you should order them. Yes. And we eat it naked in her living room. And so we continue to date, and she she continues to try to get pregnant. And eventually she invites me into the process. And the process looks something like this. Her sperm donor, Jason, lives in Philly, and we live in New York City. And so we're going back and forth turkey basting. And it's not working. And then the pandemic happens. And then we move to Chicago. And because she wants to use this particular sperm donor, we're still going back and forth to Philly. <laughs> and it's still not working. And so then we all decide we're gonna try IUI. And if you don't know what IUI is, please come see me after the show. Because I can't do it right here now. Um, so because of medical tourism and insurance, Mariella still has to go back to New York City and travel back and forth. And so we try one cycle of IUI and it fails. And we try a second cycle of IUI and it fails. And now I'm screaming from the rooftops that this fucking thing's a scam. They're just trying to steal our money. And then I'm like, all right, let's just try a third one. So we try a third cycle of IUI, and it sticks, and we get pregnant, and we're so happy, and we tell all our friends, and then we find out it's an ectopic pregnancy. And again, if you don't know that, it's come see me after the show. It's a lot. Um, blah blah blah. Um, sorry. Uh, all right. When I find this out, I'm dog sitting um, here in Chicago. And she's staying at one of my ex's apartments in New York City, because gay. <laughs> and I'm scared because I'm researching what can happen if this embryo that's inside her fallopian tube, tube ruptures. But we're talking every day. And she's getting monitored and she's, begin, she's getting chemo drugs to shrink the embryo. That's how they do that. Um, so the day before August fruit salad, um, where I have an open mic slot, I'm gearing up to tell you this story that I'm telling you right now. <laughs> she calls me at 11 p.m. And she's in pain. And that's normal because chemo drugs can give you a lot of cramping. Um, and so we stay on the phone. She takes some Tylenol and it passes. And we get off the phone around 2 a.m. At 7 a.m. she calls me again and she's in pain. And I said, I think you need to go to the hospital. And it doesn't take much time when she gets there. Um, it has ruptured, and they have to rush her into emergency surgery. Um, I pack a duffel bag. My Chicago friends are like, we got you. Just go get to her. And so I get on a plane, um, but of course, it's last summer, so all the flights are delayed. And so I can't get there before she gets out of surgery. But one of my New York City friends goes and picks her up and drives her back to the apartment. And can I just say, we have really good fucking friends. She ends up losing her left fallopian tube. And besides the grief of losing the baby, she's now um, missing a piece of herself. And we're both terribly sad, but I feel like I can't grieve right away. I have to get us out of New York City. Um, but we can't fly because she's recovering. So my sister Kayla offers to pick us up and drive us back to Syracuse where she can recover. She comes to get us, uh, two days after surgery, she comes to get us. And literally we check the GPS, two minutes after we pull out of the apartment, a utility van runs a red light and T-bones us in the intersection. I know, this is a sad story, I'm sorry. Um, the part, this part is, this is difficult for me to talk about, so bear with me. I had gone from worrying she was going to bleed out in surgery to sighing a breath of relief. And then immediately worrying again that the impact had opened her inc incisions and she was gonna bleed out in the car. The engine is smoking and I think the car is going to explode. Um, and I'm like, in my head, I'm like faced with this choice of like, who am I gonna say first, the love of my life or my sister? And I have to keep the back door open because the metal has crushed around the frame. And when I get out, there's 20 people standing around me. And so I know in that moment, I don't have to make that choice which feels good. Um, 
we all come out un, uninjured, but we're shaken. And Mariella has now more scars than she got in the car with. Um, my dad and his girlfriend are now on their way to New York City to come pick us up, along with my sister, whose car is now totaled. Um, and the next month of, is us just grieving and struggling to understand each other's process. It's stressful because we're getting older and time isn't on our side. But medically, we have to wait for four months to take the time we get are given and work on understanding each other's pain. So now we're here um, and we're doing IVF next month. coming off the motherfucking bench. And I don't think I don't think anybody's ready for my little chaos monsters, but here we go. <laughs> um, I'm gonna read you a couple baby poems. So here we go with that. You're doing great. 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 This poem, this poem, it's more like a story. It's like a, it's a poem story. Um, it's called WWBBD. What would baby be doing? <laughs> you pause the whole world and roll your body in my direction. I watch your cheeks and I smile because I know which way they fall when there is a question coming. <laughs> what would baby be doing if they were here right now? Probably sleeping. I say knowing that answer won't get us back to Real Housewives of wherever. Your, bre <laughs> your breathing tells me you're waiting for me to say more. Honestly, I'd probably have her on my lap and I'd be kissing their little biscuits. I see the tears filling as I go into a world we ache for. I tell you the silly songs I'd sing, the raspberries I'd blow. As I twirl around this place, I watch your eyes and cheeks and mouth. They are signals to my brain. I like connecting the dots when I'm telling you stories. Your cheeks point to a another question coming and so I reach for your hand. Do you think I'm going to be a good mom? You're going to be a great mom. How do you know? I squeeze your hand tighter. The answer is simple, but I have a hard time articulating it. I have a hard time telling you all the intricacies that you weave throughout the day that just makes sense to me. You're building a web for all of us so we land safely at the end of bad days. You tell us to stay down when we need to rest. You feed us with delicious foods and with your love. You cry with us. You put your hand on our hearts and tell us it's okay to feel. You squeeze my hand tighter. Your cheeks hold rivers, and I lean over and kiss them. My lips are seasoned with your tears. You, my sweet, sweet friend, are going to be the best mom. You lay your head on my chest and tuck yourself under my chin. Your breathing tells me you're content with my answers, and the world around us resumes. Woo! This one's called ultrasound. Your follicles look like caves on the monitor, nothing more intricate than watching your heart create seeds of hope. I think of them as a fern growing in your body's dark cavities. Time can feel heavy every time the sun sets on another day. But then we spend our nights after dark whispering our dreams of them into our pillows. Sometimes I sing songs into your belly button, silly ones, that make us erupt in laughter. Sometimes I tell them stories of the adventures we will go on, how dirty their biscuits will be after a day painting trails with their tiny toes. We tell broad, lovely tales, so when they finally come, they will have so much room to grow outside our lines. This last one's called Hippo. I wonder what boxes you open in my attic when you're wiping your hand like a snowplow across the tops of old cardboard. I wonder if you'll feel like you're breathing in my ghost as the dust floats through the dim sun rays, poking through specks of clean window. You'll find your magenta non-binary hippo laying there, <laughs> contemplating their very existence, detached from their left arm, their fur coat looking more like a muddy brown. You toss them aside for a cassette tape with a scribble printed in black ink for my forever nugget. You'll press it to your chest. For a second, you'll sway to the tunes, the playlist you have seared in your insides. You tuck it gently into your shirt pocket. You continue the search for me in there somewhere, or maybe you're searching for you. 
You find my pomegranate muffin recipe that failed miserably into an uncooked mush. But where you shuffled down in your bare pajamas caught me eating them with a spoon at midnight. Mm. You thought, right then, I was your favorite person. And I thought, right then, what were you doing up? <laughs> and then I handed you a fork and I told you to dig in. Please always dig in. After I'm not here anymore, even after you find yourself outside those dingy old boxes, because I promise I won't be in the dust. I'll always be making muffins in your heart. Thank you. Um, all right, this is act three. I write sappy love poems. Um, this is the act where you all fall in love with me. Um, <laughs> Um, Mariella brought me on one of our first dates, she surprised me, and she brought me to see one of my favorite poets, Eileen Miles, in New York City. Yeah. And um, Eileen Miles did this really cool thing when they were up on stage with their poems. They, they just would toss them after they were done reading them. And so after they were done, they were just surrounded by their words. And we both thought that was so co cool and so beautiful. And Mariella said, you should do something like that. I don't want to copy Eileen, but... I do want to do something like that. So what I'm going to do is after each poem, I'm going to crumble it up into a ball and I'm just going to throw it to you. Yeah. And you can keep these poems because I'm retiring them tonight. Um, I want to write new ones. So I feel like sometimes we get strapped to these, you know? And so I'm going to give them to you so you can keep them. You can give them to a partner or a friend or a family member, or you can throw them in the garbage. I don't care where you do with them, but they're yours. All right. First poem. Sin. God is not my maker. High fems are. <laughs> they say, here is my tree, eat all the fruit until you're full, until my juice is spilling from your pores. Then get on your knees and drink from my fountain. Because daddy, my love, <laughs> sorry, because daddy, I got flustered. Uh, <laughs> Let's start over a little bit. Then get on your knees, drink from my fountain, because daddy, we love sin here. We love scars here. Yeah. All right, this one's called Swallow. The <laughs> The first time I fell in love, I bit into a tomato like an apple. I was seven. I twist, sorry guys. <laughs> it's got it right down, isn't it? Uh, I twisted it off the vine, cupped it with both my hands. I could smell it before I even broke it open. When my mouth entered into its flesh, my eyes reacted first, blue and wide open. I wish I could see the juice dripping down over my chin. The sweetness erupted on my tongue. I wanted more of its acidity. When I was done, my hands covered in its leftovers, seeds sliding down back into the dirt. I took the hose to my face and hands, let the cold water wash over me. I never thought I could swallow love like that again. Bad shoulder, okay. Old man, old man at the mic. Um, all right, next poem, Invaders. I didn't realize when I was whispering my secrets into the nape of your neck that I was tying them on the ends of your hair strands like Viking braids. I'll be like Telesilla, readying you for battle, stationing you, at, stationing you at my heart walls. Please don't think about the consequences of loving me. Just keep your arrows pointed straight at my invaders. I promise to rub your ache out after your arms grow tired, when the coast is clear, when you've met all my ghosts, when you've stepped over my demons on the field of dead bodies. Will you stay with me, my love? Or will you wave the white flag? If you flee, let the waters rise, let the ground crack beneath me, let your arrows turn on me.
this one's called Pie. I wrote this one for Mariella. Um, I have this like weird like fascination with like the idea of like what people are gonna do without me <laughs> when I'm not on the earth anymore. Um, I get worried about people. Um, but this one is actually, I get like nervous that Mariella's gonna forget me. So um, when she gets older and uh, I've had people in my life have Alzheimer's and so this is Mariella getting Alzheimer's, sorry. <laughs> uh, I love you. Uh, we play this fun game where we like like to tell each other how we're going to eat each other. Uh, I'm, well, talk to me after the show. It's so funny. It's like, I don't know. I know. I'm improving and it's bad. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, all right, this, this, um, it's pertinent to the poem. Okay, it's, it's called Pie. Uh, we've been here before, and I wonder if bowls of fruit on countertops still scare you because of the thought that bugs will form in the rot. You told me once you were supposed to be alone. I told you if you eat the bananas, then they won't go bad. And you said, you're already bad. And then you laid your hand on my cheek, and I said, I'm not what I thought I would be without you. And you said, no. You are bright lemon zest. You will never go bad. And then you lost your place. Your hand retreated from my skin. You looked like a bruised apple. I said, I could make you into pie. And you mumbled something and then never returned to me. Uh, this poem's called Leo. I met you at a house party somewhere between the new moon and Orion's belt. You said you look like a young Leonardo DiCaprio. And I said, do you want to go to a real party? <laughs> you thought that was so funny. Before I knew it, your hand was wrapped around the back of my neck. Your lips tasted like the leaves you were smoking. I was already getting high off the taste of you. Somehow we made it to the back of my car. The windows fogged up just like the movies. I wanted so badly to see what else tasted good on you. Then just like that, we were sweaty, naked, sleeping, completely blissed out. And just like that, I woke up sticking to the leather seats. The sun rising took the place of your warm body. A message in red lipstick on the glass where your handprint once laid with pleasure. Thanks, Leo. Then your number, then your lips. called radishes. I wrote this a really long time ago, um, before the pandemic, which was ages and ages and ages away. It was like 2018. And um, it's funny, we almost cut it today. And then I, I thought, what's going on in Tennessee and every other state with trans anything? I don't know, this, this poem resonated with me and I wanted to keep it in for that reason. <laughs> Um, also, it was just so nice to see all my trans mask brothers up here today, so um, that was awesome. This poem is called Radishes. Today I was daydreaming about a space that was our own. Maybe an old hunting cabin with that wooden desk that we found on the side of the road that was made from an oak tree. It fell down right there. Missed the house in less than an inch. Or that's what Bill said, who decided the free sign was just a suggestion and haggled us into giving him 20 bucks. The night we drove around through that small, sleepy town off the thruway, where we saw that neon pink sign that said, bar. And you said, let's go. So I turned in, and I remember being nervous, two queers in this town. But then you took my hand and I could feel your beat. Your pulse always calmed me down. Our hearts lit up when we opened the door, to be welcomed with warmth and love by a drag queen with a blue sequin mermaid dress that was so bright I had to squint to believe. And my nervous mouth adjusted to a smile. And then we were swirled into the night until we woke up naked, wrapped up in each other at a, mot at a motel that had a neon sign that said, colored TV, a luxury in this town. <laughs> we giggled our way to the car because no matter how hard we tried, the motel soap could not get the glitter off our faces. 
and on our way out, we stopped to help a farmer whose battery died on her pickup. She had overalls that had patches sewed on with strength stretched across her, and after we gave her a jump, she threw the tarp off the back of her truck and handed us a crate. With a shrug, she said, they're supposed to be radishes. I hope you like beets. voicemail. Is that the style of a voicemail? All right. Hey, I'm calling because I'm at a bar, so I'm sorry I'm yelling, but I was calling because there was a song that this band played, the one at this bar. It reminded me of you or something about you. I'm calling because, well, you're the only number I remember by heart. I'm sorry if I'm yelling. It's really loud between my ears, but I hope you heard that. I wish you were here. I'm calling because you, because I, Never mind. Do you remember that time you poured beer over my head? What were you mad at me about? Yeah. Sorry, I'm yelling again. Some girl is screaming about her boyfriend, how he overcooks. Never mind. That doesn't matter. I like when you get rowdy. I like coming home smelling like stale beer. You told me not to shower. You cleaned me off with your tongue. Did I mention why I was calling? I'm not trying to stop you. I'm not trying to stop you. Sorry, was that clear? I'm not trying to stop you. Sorry, yelling again. Just so you know, I hope you're happy. Go be happy. That's why I'm calling. I have to go. Bye, Hart. All right. All right, these next two are pretty popular, so don't rush the stage. <laughs> <laughs> this one's called chicken soup. It's okay. You can lay on my chest and die watching Bravo. <laughs> Just not right now. Not today or on our tomorrows, because we still got a lot to do. We still have a lot to build. When we find our perfect farmhouse, I'll write love poems on all the studs I hammer into place, so that when you cover them with sheetrock, we will always know our home has a heartbeat. And I know we met later than we wanted to but we met before the world collapsed. And when everything got quiet, we took long walks in Central Park and we'd pick out the trees we wanted to be buried in. Trees that our kids would plant behind the house where they would see us from the kitchen window. Trees that our grandkids would climb to tell us the stories of their good days, their bad days, and their just okay days. And underneath them, our roots would be wrapped around each other because even in death, I want to feel at home with you. With you, I want chickens with puppy tops and goats that act like they've been with us in another life and great Pyrenees that think they're little lap dogs. With you, I want sips of coffee on our front porch as we inhale Wynn's gift of the fresh strawberries we planted the year before. I want a long driveway where we can watch all our queer friends drive up because for us, our home is for welcoming and resting and healing. I promise after we do all that and we're a tired, old, wrinkly, butch femme couple, you can poison our chicken soup, and we will die watching Bravo. <laughs> All right, this is the last love poem of the night. Um, again, please don't rush the stage. <laughs> I did some math today. I like to stick the writing words, but I was thinking about how many times I say I love you in a day. I determined on average about seven which means during a week I tell you 49 times, and then I thought, what's that for the entire year? It's 2,548. So then I thought, why not times that by 50 years? Years. I don't doubt the universe or the stars that collided that formed the sky map to bring us together. This love feels like it's already lasted 100 years. I don't think we will have a problem with half of that. I think our love is older than the Earth. I think we met as stars, I think we met as stars, I think we met as stars. I love that line. I love your lines. Can you imagine that? Us up there in some other galaxy falling in love. Maybe another couple made a wish on us. Maybe we gave out so many love wishes we faded together. And then we came back as bees. And the universe said, love each other again. Make honey. But instead we flew away from the colony and lived our days making love in flowers covered in pollen until we fell asleep in a sunflower and never woke up. And then I came back as a tree, you a squirrel. 
<laughs> and you built a home in me. You fell asleep curled up in me every night. I watched you grow into an old squirrel. I watched you have a little squirrel family. I loved them all just the same because they were part of you. But I lived much longer than you. My roots grew deeper and deeper. I spent decades without you. More squirrels built homes in me, but it wasn't the same. I missed you. My tree heart ached every day. And then the land was bulldozed and I was gone. You came back as humans, me first, then you, 10 fingers, 10 toes. The universe had plans. I remember the first time I saw you smile, I thought I must have wished for you when I was a child because you seem so familiar. Like I've loved you before in another life. How with ease I trusted you with my heart. Loving you for 50 more years will be easy. Saying I love you 127,400 times, knowing that after this life we will find each other in bees and trees. Our love began before the earth. Our love will outlast the earth. My only wish is that we become stars again. before Usher. In 2011, I had one of those very identifiable lesbian uh, Bieber haircuts. Wow. Wow, I got a lot of, oh my God. Uh, I'm on the subway on my way to work. Dark aviators on, headphones in. And um, I'm waiting for my stop, and I feel this tug on my, on my, on my shirt sleeve, and I, and I look down, and there's this little girl about 10 years old, and um, I take my headphone out, and she goes, are you Justin Bieber? <laughs> and I smile, and I'm about to shake my head no, but the train comes to a, a halt, and the door is open, and it's my stop, and so I slip out, and as I do, I put my finger to my lips. <laughs> Just so, you know, she knows to keep our secret. And uh, I, I whew, that smile, it's embedded in my head when those doors closed. She was ear to ear. It was beautiful. Um, I discovered Justin Bieber while looking for a cover of Cry Me a River by Justin Timberlake. Yeah. I stumble across his video. Um, he's fucking tiny and his guitar is bigger than he is. It's like huge. Yeah, look, at that's baby Justin there. Um, yeah, and all I can think when I'm looking at this video, I look down and he only has like 500 views and I'm like, this kid's gonna be a star. <sighs> and if I had the means, Justin Bieber would have been my prodigy and nobody can tell me otherwise. Now, if I knew what a music producer was when I was little, that's what I would have wanted to be when I grew up. But um, I didn't. So I wanted to be a cardiologist and or a rock star. Um, I feel like I've accomplished being a cardiologist um, because my love poems dissect the heart and heal it. So there, yeah. Love it. But as for being a rock star, I feel like I haven't gotten to live that dream. So for one night and one night only, these fancy tuners and, and a guitar strip, but I bought them last week, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm really nervous. This is probably the nervous I've been the whole show. Um, I'm better at talking than I am singing, but 
Um, I hope you enjoy this. Um, I'm going to play uh, a song that is a favorite of mine um, called Dirty Love by Mount Joy. Um, I think it's one of their more, more underrated songs, but I love it. Um, so. Alright, here we go. I know you think I think too much, but I don't know if it's enough. Dirty love, all I want are your eyes on mine and underneath. Of it all, I dream of a thousand shooters. Hallelujahs are already. Well, oh, forgot the words. My mind's going blank. Uh, uh, you got it. Sorry. And underneath of it all, I dream of a thousand shooters. Hallelujahs are unable to save us, but did I really want love, or did I ask too much young? Dirty love, come get us strong, let's cover up what we really want, and all you see, all you feel are skin and bones, they don't hold the soul like real love, no you can't control who you really are, who you really want. Oh, I met you in a hotel, dim little lobby I've been on the road since you last saw me And I don't need a reason to bleed until we're even But did I ever want love? Or did I ask too much young dirty love? Come get us strong, let's cover up what we really want Oh, did I really want love? Oh, too much young dirty love come get it strong let's cover up what we really want that's it <laughs> that are happening that aren't free out. There's lots of other gay shit to do. Um, yeah, and we'll see you real soon. If you got tabs, close them. Bring your cups up to the, gl uh, your glasses up to the bar. Um, and I love you.